Compost. Here it is. <laughs> so why do we do it? So a lot of gardeners call compost black gold because it's so valuable in our garden ecosystems. Um, you can, you can, you can buy it in a store, but you can also make it yourself, which is what you're going to learn how to do today. We have, and why, so why do we want it? Why is it called black gold? If you remember, soil is made up of about 50% pore space for us for air and for water. 45% is just the mineral component of sand, salt, or clay. And then just 5%, this 5% wedge right here is organic matter, but it plays such an important role of cycling nutrients, making those nutrients available for plants to take up and turn into their cysts like their cells, um, holding on to moisture, uh, providing habitat for other beneficial organisms, like all of those, all of those things. Um, so huge, important role. And if we make it ourselves, we help to create a closed loop system in our gardens, which is a really key component in sustainable agriculture, is looking at our wastes in terms of the weeds that we're harvesting, or sorry, the weeds that we're weeding, or plants that we harvest that we can't actually use because they're rotting or whatever, and turning that waste into a resource instead of having our compost hauled away by the city and then buying it back again from the store. So better for the environment, better for us, better for our wallets, um, better for everything. So there's a lot of different types of compost and ways that you can make compost happen. And really compost is just a form of controlled rot. Things are gonna rot. Uh, if I leave this stick out long enough, microbes are gonna do their things and break the stick down over time. Compost is just sort of a way to speed that process up and there's a lot of different ways you can do that. So the first method I'm gonna to talk to you about is the hot pile. It's called the hot pile because it's, it's hot. <laughs> it can get actually up to like 140 degrees Fahrenheit uh, or 60 degrees Celsius and is really efficient and effective at breaking down organic waste. So these compost piles can um, produce compost really quickly, but they require a lot more attention. So a three bin system is common if people are doing this type of compost at home. They've got their first bin for adding new material to, then they turn it over. Um, we, actually, some people do it daily, but I, I do it weekly. So turn it over daily or weekly to keep adding in oxygen. We'll talk about that later. They put they they put it into a second bin, which is closed, where um, they don't add any material, but they're just turning it. And then when it's kind of close to being done, they put it in the finished bin where it can um, finish out the last bit of its decomposition cycle and wait to be used. So that's the hot pile. Um, the cold pile is for people who are a little bit lazier about their compost or have the space or time to wait. And like I said, anything's going to rot given enough time. And a cold pile is um, you just you add your organic matter. And I'll, I'll talk about the ratio of greens to browns later. But you add your organic matter, you add water, you make sure it's got enough moisture. And then you don't turn it. You just let it sit for sometimes up, up to a couple of years until it's... Um, decompose and then you can use it. So this is great for people who've got a lot of land or acreage and you can just kind of put this on like the so-called back 40 and let it do its thing. One risk there is that you could have um, pests like rats or other organisms. I guess if it's out far enough that that might just be fine because they may just be helping you do that decomposition um, but you can also attract uh, pests that you don't want maybe like bears or raccoons. In which case you just have to be careful about what you add to this pile. Maybe it's just yard waste and not your rotting vegetables or kitchen scraps. All right, another way to compost is with worms. It's called vermicomposting. This is actually my favorite way to compost. I have a YouTube video about my worm bin. That I will link to in the speaker notes below. Um, it's, it, lets, it lets these worms do your work. So you've got some limitations of what you can feed the worms. They don't like acids or onions, um, no meats or cheeses. Uh, but it's, it's a really, it produces super rich compost because the worms break down the organic matter and they produce castings or poop that are really high and rich in nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium, those things that your plants need to grow. There's a lot of ways you can make worm bins. Uh, one way that you can make it is lets you 
do worm composting yeah. indoors and it just uses a couple stacked um, Tupperware containers that you drill holes into for drainage and air and you add bedding to and the worms and your food scraps and it's great. You can keep it inside. It doesn't even smell bad. Uh, people will be very surprised when they open the lid and you're like, oh, that's a worm bin. I even know a person who has a worm bin coffee table. Bam! Mine's actually outdoors um, and it's a little bit bigger and it's also a bench, which I really like. Those are the same kind that are in the Stegen Satellite Garden if you've ever seen those. All right. Sheet mulching, is, it's, it's, I included it in the composting section because it is a type of compost. You, it's, a, it's a way to um, sometimes kill grass, if that might be a goal, or just like create some good organic uh, topsoil. Um, it's a non-invasive way to make garden soil instead of like digging up the sod and tilling the soil. <laughs> Um, it lets things rot. It just takes a little bit more time and maybe some patience. And this is a layering of lots of different materials. Um, people have a lot of different recipes for how to sheet mulch the best. I usually do, you know, newspaper, then cardboard, then compost, then then bark mulch on top, and then I keep it watered. Um, but there's lots of different ways that you can do sheet mulching. You maybe have seen people do this, like out in their front yards for their gardens. Leaf mulch is another type of compost, but is specific to leaves. Oak leaves are really great for this. Uh, maple are okay. You don't want to use pine needles. They're pretty acidic. Um, but lots of other types of leaves, like alder leaves, will work too, and, and other types of leaves. But basically, you just put all your leaves in a wire mesh um, container, and you let them sit for, I think, a year, maybe two. Um, turn them maybe once after the first year. Let it sit again, and then you've got some really rich and awesome mulch that you can use as top dressing around your plants or in some sort of pile of soil, maybe. Last type I'm going to explain is, <laughs> is hugel culture. Hugel culture. It's so fun to say hugel culture. It's uh, German, and um, it's, it's basically controlled rot, but it, in this case, you're trying to make a garden bed um, from your rot pile. So I like to think about this sort of as a nurse log, if you've ever heard that term. So when a tree falls over in the whole growth forest and starts to rot, starts to rot and becomes um, like a whole ecosystem for organisms and other plants. They're, they're, so basically you stack up logs or large woody material. You add compost on top of that. Some people add straw on top of that. And then you plant um, around the, <laughs> sorry, baby. Uh, okay. Um, and what's really great about hugel culture is they act as sort of like a giant sponge. So most people never water their hugel culture after they've established them because they, they retain a lot of water. I don't know if you've ever um, picked up a log that's rotting in the woods, but they're really spongy. So um, that those lignin, anyway, going too deep. Uh, another great form of passive compost where you're not turning anything, but you're just letting things rot and you're utilizing that as a space to grow your crops. So let's get into the science of how composting works. So like any system, it has inputs and the outputs. The inputs to compost are water, air as an oxygen, uh, bacteria, fungi, and microbes macroorganisms like earthworms and insects, and then um, browns and greens, which I'll talk about in a moment. And that produces compost. It also produces, that diagram doesn't have it, heat. So even the cold compost is going to release some heat because of the metabolism that's happening in there. And carbon dioxide is usually emitted from, uh, what well, is emitted from compost piles because the microorganisms and other organisms are doing respiration, aerobic respiration, where they're taking in oxygen and carbon material like lignin or cellulose, and then they are exhaling or excreting carbon dioxide from that process, just like we do. Um, there are different stages of compost, especially like if you have a hot compost. So there's this initiation phase where the microorganisms are just starting to colonize. Um, and they start to heat up because they're doing metabolism, releasing heat. And eventually the compost pile gets so hot around 50 degrees Celsius or 100 and something degrees Fahrenheit that only the thermophiles or the heat loving bacteria 
can survive in those temperatures, but they're really good at decomposition. So they do really fast decomposition. They release even more heat. It heats up, it heats up, and then it gets so hot that it, it kills them. It kills the thermophiles. Um, and that's like I said, that, that key temperature is around 140 for like optimal composting. Uh, and then it goes back to what is called the mesophile range again, or those bacteria that like a, a middle range of temperature. All right, like I keep promising, we're gonna talk about the browns versus the greens. So in a healthy and active compost pile, um, you will want a good mixture of browns to greens, and that is carbon to nitrogen ratio. So the ideal ratio here is 30 to one, 30 parts carbon to one part nitrogen. So carbons are coming from the browns are coming from things like dead leaves, not fresh leaves, um, straw, not hay. Straw is the stuff that's left over after you harvest the hay. It's like the, the stuff around the, the chaff, I guess. Um, wood chips, sawdust, dead plants, dead in like like brown plants. <laughs> um, and coffee and tea actually are not browns. They're considered greens. This, is, this diagram is wrong because coffee has a ton of nitrogen in it. So greens are things like fresh food scraps, grass clippings, eggshells, garden weeds, aquatic weeds, farm and animal manure, and coffee. Perhaps. So you want that ratio to be um, nice and 30 to one. So a lot of people get smelly or greasy compost. Um, and one of the reasons why that could happen, there's a couple, is that they might have way too many nitrogens going in, which are their food scraps and not enough carbons. So you can um, add carbons by, yeah, like putting in hay, shredded newspaper, um, just finding something that's going to act as a brown to balance out those greens. Moisture, a lot of people don't think about this, but compost piles need to be Kind of the moisture, we think about it as a wrung out sponge. So wring out a sponge and then holding your hand, that's about the moisture you want a compost pile to be. Not dripping like this sponge, but like wrung out. And people actually in this region have to water their compost in the summer. I like to keep a cover over my compost, like a tarp or a lid, and give it a really healthy dose of water, like a few gallons, sometimes weekly, um, to keep it moist. You might want to dig down in a little bit just to see. Poke your finger down in and see, like, oh, is that moist in there? They also need oxygen to be super productive because those little bacteria need the oxygen to do the metabolism. And this is called aerobic decomposition. So aerobic, like aerobic, I'm doing aerobic, I'm doing aerobic workout, and the oxygen. Those bacteria also um, need oxygen to do cellular respiration, right? Aerobic cellular respiration. That's just a picture of bacteria. They're kind of boring looking. And these are major respiratory pathways of, I'm not going to get into that, but right, we take it in glucose and we turn it into with oxygen. So there's another type of respiration or um, decomposition called anaerobic. So that is what happens when you don't have oxygen. And this, this is actually sometimes a desired form of compost, but usually at home, if you're getting anaerobic decomposition, you usually don't want that because it produces a lot of bad, bad smells <laughs> like nitrogen in the form of ammonia, which smells really bad, and sulfur, um, sorry, sulf sulfide, sulf like a sulfur molecule that also smells like really bad, like rotten eggs or poop or it's, it's, it's awful. Um, but some people do this on purpose. Um, it's called anaerobic digestion. Uh, it's, it's how biogas is made. And so usually people add manure, but it could be wastewater biosolids, like, like poop water, um, food waste, or other organics. I'm trying to think of... Oh, they do this in landfills. They harvest the anaerobic decomposition from landfills sometimes. And uh, But you can also do it through these digesters that are specifically anaerobic, so they don't let any oxygen in on purpose, and they get out methane, which is used as a biogas, which you can use as fuel for all kinds of things, like cooking. They do this a lot in India. People have like little biogas chambers where they put in cow manure, and then they use that methane that comes off of that straight, piped straight into like a cooking stove or a heating stove. Uh, how to use your compost? Well, you just went over one way. You can totally use biogas if you're doing anaerobic decomposition. But most of us are doing aerobic decomposition. 
And when you have your finished pile ready to go, you first you want to screen it. So you take out all the big chunks um, or not, not so digested or, or decomposed um, particles. And you can change the mesh. I usually use a quarter inch mesh and you can make your own tray like this. You just, you know, put four pieces of wood together and then tack on your screen. And then you can kind of just screen your compost through. There's big versions of this, but this is really all you need at home. And then you can dig it directly into your garden beds yearly. You should definitely dig in compost yearly to your garden beds. Um, or you can use it as a top dressing. Vermicompost or worm compost is especially great for this top dressing, which acts as sort of a mulch, and then the nutrients slowly go down into the soil. Um, or you can use it if it's finely uh, screened enough, you can use it to make your own potting soil, which I have also done and love doing. Compost tea. Oh, one thing I should mention is that some compost piles don't get hot enough to kill weed seeds or um, funguses or other diseases. So if you're not doing a super hot compost pile that you're kind of taking, you're, you're, you're monitoring the temperature of, um, then you want to be careful about what you put into your bins. So you don't want to put in things that are going to be pests or weeds in your garden in the future. I, I like I never put in morning glory or bind weed into my compost because I do not want any of those little roots or seeds to be in my um, soil for the future. Okay, you can dig it in, you can use this top dressing, you can make potting soil out of it, or you can make compost tea. Yes, that's the thing. Um, you basically brew, you, you sometimes I use a sock, <laughs> like it's just an old sock, and I don't use an aeration system, although you can, it makes like way healthier tea because it activates those bacteria. Um, but you can just soak your, like a little bit of compost in a five gallon bucket. You do have to use it fairly quickly because it can go bad or rancid fairly fast. And then you can use it to water indoor plants or outdoor plants. Um, yeah, it's just like an awesome thing you can do with it. Whoa, that was probably too long because I was a little distracted by babe. But to recap, there are many different ways to compost. It is super important to the health of your soil to add organic matter anytime you can. Um, and this is one way to do it. It also helps to create a closed loop system, which we're trying to um, make in a sustainable agriculture. And there's a lot of really cool science behind composting and you can get really deep into it. But as with everything gardening, just try it out, experiment, see what works, see what doesn't, modify as you go um, and enjoy yourself learning along the way. See you.